the Gospel according to Luke chapter 1. This is actually going to be the last day for a very long time that you're going to hear me say chapter 1. As Brittany said um, during announcements and stuff, we uh, appreciate you guys as a church and stuff um, being at the visitation and, and uh, just coming, you know, for the, the funeral and stuff like that, it meant a whole lot to us and whatnot, and um, even Mackenzie uh, mentioned to me, either this morning or yesterday, she said she looked over and didn't know, you know, most of the church was there and looked over and saw you guys, and it was just, it was amazing to see everyone when there and the body pulled together, so we really appreciate you guys, thank you so much. It's been a difficult week, I'll tell you I'm more nervous than usual because I didn't have the preparation time to pour into this message like I would have liked. Um, so bear with me this morning, but either way, it's God's word. Um, if we just read it and closed in an amen, um, it would be a, it would be enough, but you all know I don't ever let you off that easy. And so, and I never will. So, so let's, uh, read this morning, Luke chapter one, verses 67 through 80. This is the final portion of chapter one. We will begin chapter two next week. And then, um, praise God. In uh, two or three weeks, July 4th, whatever weekend that is, I think that's in two weeks, um, Dakota is going to come and share a message on the kingdom of God to kind of wrap some stuff up and point stuff in the future. I'm excited about that. Please be here to support him on that Sunday. This is the living word of God, the inspired word of God, and this is what he says. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord, God of Israel. For he has visited and he has redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Upon the reading of God's word this morning, if you will bow your head in prayer to Christ. Lord God, thank you so much for how good you are to us. God, thank you so much just for uh, this body, God. God, I know it is a prayer. It is a way of thanksgiving that I say to you often. We are so appreciative, God, of this congregation, Lord, though small, God, but I believe in a mighty way through your mercy and through your spirit, very powerful. God, thank you for all that you're doing. God, specifically, thank you for the life that you gave my grandmother. God, for the uh, um, 80 years, God, that you just sent her to be here with us, God, to be able to do all the things that you did to your sovereign will through her, Lord. What an example, what a testimony she was to many, God, and especially us um, as grandchildren, as, as family members. God, this morning, as we go through this amazing gospel, a gospel that you have given us, this is not our gospel. This is not the gospel of a coworker, a friend, or of the church. This is your gospel, God, and we praise you and thank you for it, God. God, I just ask that everything that I say this morning uh, be to your glory, God. And as John would say, God, this morning I help. I hope that uh, me as a, an individual, God, as a person, as an image bearer, will continue to decrease. Um, God, that any popularity that starts to come my way, that it will always be forwarded to you. God, that you will increase. I pray the same thing for anybody in this congregation, God. We want to unite together in the name of Jesus, continue to boldly proclaim your message. And we thank you and praise you for that message. 
God, take away our distractions this morning. Let this be all about you and everything that you have done, everything that you are doing. God, we give you all the glory. We love you and we praise you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So where we've been so far is at this point, there has been a lot that has happened. And we've covered a little bit of deep in the theology and in some areas of the scripture. But we had these two women, Mary and, um, Mary and, oh my goodness, Elizabeth. Sorry, I'm about to say Martha. Mary and Elizabeth that were both uh, pregnant. Mary still at this point is, but Elizabeth has given birth to this baby boy named John. And the parents and all the surrounding elders and the village elders, they live in this hill country, they know that something is very um, spectacular, significant, important about this child. Um, because you don't just have a child, and what they believe, probably Elizabeth and Zachariah were probably close to the age of seven, anywhere from like 70 to 90. People usually fall in the line of right around the age of 80, but that's just not normal. And so, therefore, they know that something's very amazing about this child. They know what's happened to Zachariah. He was mute. He was deaf. Now he is transformed again. Everything is renewed to him by God's graciousness. And so now, uh, basically, here's this baby boy named John. And so what we're going to see this morning is Zachariah, because he can speak again, is going to do what is called a benedictus. And a benedictus is a praise to God. It's a thanksgiving to God, but at the same time, he is going to lay out prophecy. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to actually speak in the words of Zechariah. I'm going to say things about things that were to come because what he's going to tell you is, is all this is already happening. The reason he's saying that is because it's prophetic. He's telling you something that is happening in the future, but at the same time is also happening within their very midst in Israel. So he's going to break it into two different categories. Now, the main section of this scripture is focused on the Messiah, the Mashiach, Jesus himself. And then you're going to see a little tiny bit of portion of this scripture around the middle in the very end is going to highlight John. OK, so we'll talk um, a little bit about that and how it's broken up in just a minute. So Zachariah has just received this miracle. He's received his voice. He's received his hearing back, but he doesn't concentrate on himself. Instead, he is about to do this benedictus, praise God, thank you God for all that you're doing, and this is, uh, this is the, the Zachariah that we've been wanting to see. This is the one that was earlier was called righteous and blameless before God. This is the family member, Zachariah, the husband, that we have been waiting to see, and he is about to really show us his character and how he praises God through this prophecy right here in this section. Now, let's look at verse 67. I'm going to break this down to a few different sections this morning. We're going to focus on this one verse for just a minute. Now, I've talked about this very often. It says that Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit. Once again, this is not talking about regeneration. I'm not going to dig any more into that because I know I've covered that twice in detail. But just for reference, when people say it is talking about he is born again right here in this passage, the question that always needs to go out is, how is Zechariah and Elizabeth righteous and blameless before God if they haven't been regenerated until this point? Because earlier in chapter 1, it says just that. They walk in a righteous, a blameless manner. Romans 3 says, no one is righteous, no one is blameless, no one even does what is spiritually good, all dead in our trespasses and sins. So therefore, it is talking about he has been endowed by the Spirit of God to carry out a certain task. Now, whenever I say that, there should be something that immediately jumps to your mind. Because what does this say? It says he was filled with the Holy Spirit and then he prophesied. <laughs> so I think it's funny right here that you have a family, all three of them. John the Baptist is in his mom's tummy. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. What does he do? He <laughs> prophesies. He's the forerunner. Then Elizabeth prophesies, and people say, no, 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 there's no way she prophesies. She's not a mouthpiece for God. The same text right here isn't the same with Elizabeth and um, Zechariah. The problem is this. If her words are in Scripture, she prophesied. She was used as a mouthpiece for God. Do we have her words in Theonistos Scripture? Yes, so she did. 
And lastly, we see now it is time for Zechariah, the father, the husband. He is going to now prophesy. He has been given the power of God to be able to speak the word of God. And that's what you're going to see him do. Now let's look at verses 68 through 71. 68 through 71. Verse 68 says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and he has redeemed his people. Now some people, when we get into this Benedictus, they immediately say that this is all referring to John the Baptist. I do not believe that this is accurate in any way. And the reason why is John the Baptist did not redeem his people. He was a man that called people to repentance but something that you need to know is if you go to verse 69, it says that the one that is coming to visit and redeem sits in the house of David. And so who comes from the line of David? Is that John the Baptist? No, he's from the line of Levi, from the line of Aaron. He's from the priestly line. Right here, Jesus, the Messiah, from the line of also Mary, comes from the line of David. So this is talking mostly about Jesus right here. Now, once again, what you see at the beginning of this is it says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. He starts praising God. And if you remember, what happens to Zechariah when his mouth is fully restored by God? He says, Blessings God. Blessing God. He immediately starts praising God. Now, I want to be honest with you um, this morning. If I am mute and deaf for nine months, I, I, I tried to think a lot about this this week, and I, I'm just going to be real with you. I think there would be some part of me that kind of would hold a grudge if God had done that to me for nine months, especially during the time that here's Wake and Brittany's tummy and all the things that you want to talk about, all the, the, the discussions that you need to have and stuff, and here I am just writing everything on a tablet. We'd probably be pretty frustrated. But what I love about this man is, once again, his true character comes out and he starts praising God for all that he's doing. It's like he kind of way overlooks that and he knows that God is able to do that because he is sovereign, he is in control, and he has no authority to question God for closing his mouth and his ears. And I think sometimes, just to be honest with you, Kyle can kind of get this attitude um, that rises up of like, God, why did you do that to me? How dare you do that to me? It's an unbiblical attitude. It's an attitude that we should never take. And Zechariah does not take that attitude right here. Instead, he thanks God for the Messiah that is coming, for the Messiah that is already there in Mary's womb, and for his little boy, John, that is born. That would have been a spectacular thing to witness. The main section of this I want you to focus on this morning, though, is he says that this one that is coming... That is from the house of David. He is coming to visit and redeem his people. Now, this was often um, common in the Old Testament. But there's this whole new area. This whole new way in which God is going to come and redeem his people and visit his people. Now, what it says in the Old Testament, I'm going to give you a few examples. We're not going to exhaust this um, in any way today. But I want you to listen for it. When we talk about redemption. When we talk about God visiting his people, how he did it often in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. It says, Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers and the God of Abraham, of Isaac and Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land that is flowing with milk and honey. One chapter later, Exodus 4, 31, God says all this to Moses, all this to the people, the Israelites. And then he says this in verse 31. And the people believed, and they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel, and that he had seen their affliction, and they bowed their heads and worshiped. So right here in the text in Exodus, it says that God came and he visited his people. 
God is telling Moses, I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to bring you up out of the affliction of the Egyptians and raise you up, bring you back eventually to the land flowing with milk and honey. And that's exactly what he does. In Ruth chapter 1, verse 6, we see the exact same thing. Then she arose, this is talking about Naomi, she arose with her daughters-in-law to return to the country of Moab. For she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So what we see in the Old Testament is God would usually visit his people through the way of a prophet. Through the way of a prophet. Now, there was other circumstances and stuff. You had the burning bush. You have even where Moses is able to see the backside of God and stuff like that. But other than that, he mainly would speak and visit through prophets. Now, guys, here's the most amazing thing, and I get so pumped um, whenever I talk about this, whenever I study this, because it, it blows my absolute mind every time that I read it. Zechariah is not talking about the same type of visitation. He is not about to do this through a prophet. Yes, John is going to be the forerunner, but Yahweh is coming to earth. He is coming to earth to redeem his people, to visit his people. Now, guys, think about that just for a second. Yahweh, God incarnate, right, is sitting there, and he is in front of all of his people. And imagine all the miracles that he's doing. Imagine everything that's going on, and you're watching Jesus. So think that you have the knowledge that you have now of the gospel. You have the knowledge of all the gospels, of all the writing of the text, of all the scripture, and you're looking at Jesus. And you know everything that he's doing. A man sticks out his hand, and Jesus can just speak it into becoming normal again. He can heal the blind. He can raise the dead. He can do miraculous works. And in this whole time, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, these religious leaders are looking at this man and they're going, we don't get his teaching. No one. It's not like there's a few people that teach like him. Nobody teaches like this man and has the authority that he has. Now, if we could go back in time, hypothetically today, and watch Jesus I guarantee every single one of us that are born again, regenerated, saved by Christ, would look at Jesus and we would just glue our eyes to him. Why? Because the man that walked the earth is the same man in Colossians 1 that made everything. Like, who are you going to look at? There's the man right there, the God man, Yahweh in the flesh. Part of the Trinity, a person of the Trinity is before you. Like, where else are you going to look at? You're going to observe everything that he does. Everything that he does. And so what Zechariah is telling us, this isn't like the Old Testament. This is nothing like this. God, Yahweh, is actually coming to dwell amongst his people to visit, and he is going to save them. He is going to redeem them. We'll talk about that redemption here in just a little bit. Sometimes I don't always think that we get the context. And I've talked about this often. I want to constantly remind us of this. This will kind of be one of the last times that I do remind us of this. Remember that there's 400 to 430 years of prophetic silence. There's this giant gap. Now, guys, whenever it even comes to the, the foundation of this country, go back to uh, Lincoln, go back to Jefferson, go back to, um, the um, let's say, um, goodness, George Washington, go back to even before him. The foundation of our country, guys, that happened less than 400 years ago. All of that did. So think about the lengthy time these people have been waiting, been waiting for the prophecy that they read about in the Old Testament to take place of this one that was to come and establish a kingdom to visit his people and to redeem him. And this is a mystery to them. They don't really get everything that's going to happen. They're like, okay, there's this one that's coming. He's going to be pierced. Man, he's, he's high and mighty. It's God. Like, like, how do we make sense of this? And you know, Zechariah, to him and him, it was a mystery at times as well. But at the same time, they know that he is coming. And that's kind of the context. They are on the edge of their seat waiting for the Messiah to reveal himself. And what's so funny is people are looking at John during that time. And they're going, it's got to be you. It's got to be you, John. Look at the way that you're speaking. 
And John's basically like, guys, you got it way off. The one that is coming is so much greater than me. I'm not even anywhere in a parallel direction to him. I'm not anywhere close to him. He is the one that I can't even bow down and untie his sandals. He is that great and he is that mighty. God coming to earth. Now the next thing that I want to look at, if you look at verse 69 with me, this is pretty interesting, but it says that God is going to raise up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Once again, Jesus comes from the lineage line of David. We know that it is speaking of him. But what is the horn of salvation? Now, in the Old Testament, the horn of salvation was a common metaphor for a warrior. Okay? It was a common metaphor for a warrior. But what does the horn represent? Well, it doesn't represent a trumpet. It's not an instrument. It doesn't represent the horn of the altar. But instead, this horn represents a weapon. It represents, in the Old Testament, an animal that was frequently mentioned was oxen. And so you had these ox, you had these giant horns that were on them, pretty sharp at the very end. And so that's the picture that we get here. It's a warrior that is holding a weapon to bring redemption, to bring salvation in order to save his people. But more importantly, guys, whenever we say the horn of salvation, that he is a warrior talking about Christ, that is a title in the New Testament that is given specifically to Jesus, to Jesus. Now, as we grow up, I'll be honest with you, this week was the very first time that I'd ever heard Jesus referred to that as. I had to look up many different commentaries to make sure that that was accurate and make sure that was actually a title for him. And it is, is what I took away from this. But whenever you're growing up, you will hear Jesus referred to many different titles, such as the true vine, the way, the rock, the lamb of God, the good shepherd, the bridegroom, the gate, and the light of the world. But rarely, rarely do we ever refer to Jesus as a warrior. But guys, everyone thought that he was going to lose in history. Everyone's looking at this king. Everyone's looking at this mighty warrior. And there comes a point where they back away and they go, uh, he's being taken away. They're dragging this man away. And the disciples are sitting there and they're like, oh, Jesus, we'll never deny you. We'll stick with you for the rest of your days. No matter what happens, we've seen the miracles. We know the teaching. You have revealed yourself to us. And it has only been revealed because Jesus says because it was the spirit of God that he revealed himself to these apostles, to these disciples. And therefore, at the end of the day, who denies him three times? Well, the one that's kind of going to build the foundation of the church, Peter does. And Peter's like, no, 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 God. No, that, that's not going to happen. Not me. It might be somebody else. It might be some of these disciples that kind of followed you from afar, but not me. And he says, surely I tell you this very night, you'll deny me three times before the rooster crows. <clears throat> Did it happen? It happened. It happened. Everyone thought that Jesus lost the battle. And then what happens three days later? He conquers death. He does something no one else could. And all the Jehovah's Witnesses come against Christianity and they say, well, who raised Jesus from the dead? It only had to be the Father. The Scripture says the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit did. Jesus raised himself from the dead. Therefore, Jesus is a warrior. You know, this week, being an emotional week with my uh, the passing of my grandmother, there was something pretty cool that took place. I even talked to Brittany or anybody about it. But Wake came over and Gray was pushing Wake and I had taken a few minutes just to uh, get off my feet and set, sit down and stuff. And those that came to the uh, visitation, it was, it was packed from the very beginning to the very end. Like there was people still coming in at 8.05. I remember looking at my phone being like, wow, like people really love my grandmother. So I went over at one time and I sat down. And so Wake came over and he said something. I don't remember what he said. But he said something about the resurrection. And Gray looked at me and said, what is he talking about? And this is all I remember from, from this conversation. I said, well, what Wake's talking about is there's going to be a physical and spiritual resurrection of the dead on the last day. And so Gray looked at me and he said, 
Like, like Grammy? She's for her too? I said, Grammy as well. I said, that's the beauty of Christianity. He leaves and they go for about five minutes to the, uh, the cafeteria where all the food was and stuff. And he comes back and he says, Uncle Kathy, he says, when is this going to take place? I said, when Jesus returns. Jesus wins in all areas of life. Even us. He conquers death. He conquers everything. And that's the beauty of what we believe. And what's so amazing today, and I don't want to get on a high horse on this today, but something that you know is kind of just a pet peeve of mine is within the Christian modern evangelical church. Everyone says Jesus loses in all of history. Yes, he's able to raise himself from the dead, but when it comes to our world, when it comes to the nations, when it comes to establishing all the enemies under his feet, he can't conquer that. The thing is, is this, if Jesus can overcome death and raise himself from the grave, do you not think that he has sovereign providential control over this world? He does. And he wins in all areas, whether the atheist, the agnostic, or the atheist scientist at, it, scientist at MTSU like it or not. <laughs> Booyah. He wins in everything. That's what's so amazing about this story and the gospel that we are given. So Jesus comes and he establishes his kingdom. And as it says right here in verse 71, that he should save the people from their enemies and from the hands of all who hate them. Now we're going to pour into this a lot later on in the text of the gospel, especially here in Luke. But what he's basically saying right here is there's coming a day where you don't have to fear the Romans. There's coming a day with these hypocritical Pharisees and Sadducees and religious leaders that you don't have to fear them anymore. Even if they persecute you, guess what? You still win. You're still able to advance the gospel. Whether you die, congratulations, we're in the arm of Christ. Whether you live, the gospel advances. No matter what, what Zechariah is telling us right here is he is saving us in every category of life. And he's also going to do the exact same thing for this world. And that's so important that we understand that. It doesn't say in Scripture that he is actually going to make and form a new world. It says he's making all things new. So what happened at the very beginning? The creation happened. Perfect, holy, righteous. God looks at everything and says, good. The fall happens. Jesus comes to redeem his people. Now he has established his kingdom, making everything new again. However, that's going to look at the end of the days. I have no idea, but I know God says it's going to happen. So what do we ultimately deserve as Christians when we talk about Jesus coming, the horn of salvation, to visit and redeem his people? Here's a question that we need to ponder. We need to ponder it often. What do we as Christians ultimately deserve? We could even say just vastly people in general. We deserve the wrath of God. Every one of us. That's what we deserve. There's been nothing in us, nothing in us that have merited anything when it comes to salvation or when it comes to meriting anything that we get. Right? Like even at times we think that we are due our children. We think that we are due our grandchildren. We think that we are due this life that is above many others. And everything that we're given, the Bible tells us, it's by the grace of God. He's given that to us. I know oftentimes it's very, very hard when we go to the abortion mill. When we go to the abortion mill and people, um, people will come up to us and they'll tell us their story of losing a child or losing stuff like that. And we will really sympathize with them and we will... We will be very gracious with them and talk to them and stuff. And it usually comes from non-Christians. And they just say, man, what a mean God that would ever take the life of a child. And the thing that people don't understand is, guys, we, we didn't even deserve to be in our mother's womb to begin with. Everything that we are given is by the grace of God. And so we are ultimately due wrath. So before the righteousness of Christ, we are called in Scripture children of wrath. That is what we are due. Now here's the question I want you guys to ponder. I want you guys to think about really quick. What is it that we are being saved from ultimately? Are we just saved from death? Well, yes. We still die, but in a way, not really. We're going to end up living a life somewhere that's either going to be in the torments of hell, separation from God, or be with Christ for eternity. 
Well, do we, um, are we saved from sin? In a way, God sanctifies us. We are still sinners. We still end up sinning, even though in Scripture he calls us saints. Somewhat within our nature, even given a new nature, God is continuing to work through us. But what most people don't think about, when we ask, what are we saved from? What are we saved from? Here's the answer. You are saved from God. God sends his son, who is also Yahweh, who is also God incarnate, to save you from his wrath that every single one of us deserve. Now, what did that look like? That looks like this. Jesus gets up on the cross. Before that, he's beaten, he's bruised, he's battered. He's whipped to where his flesh is torn into pieces. He's cuffed. They place a crown of thorns on his head. Head And all the people, his creation, look at him. And when they're looking at him, Jesus, humble, with all the meekness and humility that none of us can ever bear, that none of us will ever have, still looks at his creation and says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're even doing. They don't even get it. He takes the entire wrath of God and he exhausts it to its fullest so that you and I don't have to. <coughs> so we don't have to bear that pain. And the thing is, when people say, well, Kyle, could you bear that pain if you needed to? No. No. Well, Kyle, could you do it for your son? Because you love your son. You love your family. Could you exhaust that pain and the sin of the world from the almighty God if you needed to? No. No, there's only one that could do it, and it has to be God. It has to be God. That's why he is the whole highest standard, and he does that for us. What are you ultimately saved from? You're saved from God. You are saved from God. So God sends his son to save you from his wrath. That is a merciful God. That is a loving God, and that is a God that is due all praise. Even if he didn't save us, praise God, he did. He is still due all praise for giving us the breath of life. What an amazing God. Guys, we often think of Jesus ending in this passage right here, not as a warrior, but we often think of him as this passive, aggressive pansy of a man. I remember growing up in church and Sunday school and stuff, you don't really ever hear of the warrior side of Jesus, of the Jesus that saves, of the Jesus that redeems, but instead what you hear about is sometimes this Jesus that's just so meek and mild and so sincere that he's just walking around smoking a doobie, just giving everyone hugs like a giant hippie, right? Like that's what you hear all the time. That's what our culture is ingrained with. Well, what's Jesus like? Well, he just loves everybody. He loves everything that you do, and he's just this forgiving God. And like he loves the he loves the sinner, he just hates the sin. Guess what, guys? Jesus doesn't throw the sin into hell. He throws the sinner into hell. He throws image bearers of God into hell. That's the God he is because he is just. And sometimes we adopt this mindset of Jesus that he's just this passive aggressive man that's never bold at any of his approach. He doesn't really do anything. He doesn't like controversy, right? So he just goes about his days and he doesn't worry about anything. And just everyone that comes up to him bows to the knee. He just gets on and says, you're fine in your sin and what you're doing. That's not the God of Scripture. That's not the God of Scripture. But instead, we serve a God that made a whip, went into the temple, looked at them and said, you are robbers. You are hypocrites. You are Pharisees that have completely missed the mark on everything that you should have known according to the word that you studied from an early age. We serve Jesus that before his resurrection, before they even arrest him in the Garden of Gethsemane, is actually sweating blood. Now, scientifically, to get to the area and to the point to where you're sweating blood, guys, it's been done very few times in history. And the ones that do do it are going through such agonizing pain that it's unbearable. And that's the Christ that we serve Blood is pouring out basically from his blame, uh, um, veins all the way through his skin <coughs> out to, onto the flesh where the people are even noticing it. He is the one that called people to repentance. Yes, he is a loving God, but he is also a God that is going to judge. 
But once again, Zechariah is saying he is visiting, and with him visiting, he is bringing salvation to his elect. To his elect. Guys, if we preach that message from right now until I die, whenever that might be, maybe the church, church lasts for 10 years, maybe it lasts for 300 years, whatever it is, if the same message was preached every single Sunday, it should still make us be in awe before a holy God because he's done that. If we realize who we are before him. That's how good he is to us. And Zachariah is saying, he's here. He's coming. He's in Mary's womb. Watch what's about to happen. It's an amazing story. Verses 72 through 75. Now what he's going to do now is he's going to move in talking a little bit about the covenant that God made with Abraham. He says to show the mercy promised to our fathers. So to the ancestors. And to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us. Now, this one is so, so neat. I'm going to get there in just a minute. This one um, is also very interesting. And it's uh, fantastic to study once you get the full picture. Now, remember what God did in the Old Testament. He makes a covenant with Abraham. And he says this, Abraham, there is one that is coming from your seed, from your line. I'm going to give you your child, a boy. And he's going to be like really your only boy. Yes, you have Ishmael from the slave Hagar, but in a way he doesn't really count. That's not the son of the promise. The son of the promise is coming through you and through Sarah in your old age. So what he does is he basically blesses Abraham and Sarah. And so now Sarah is pregnant in her old age and she is going to give birth to a son named Isaac. And so from that line is going to go all the way to David, David, all the way to Jesus. Okay? Very, very simple. All the way from David, all the way to Jesus. Now here's what Zechariah is starting out telling us right here. Now I've said this many times from the pulpit, and we'll continue to talk about it through the weeks ahead. <laughs> Zechariah is trying to show us that everything that God says is going to pass will come to pass. He's also telling us and showing us that God keeps his covenant. Why? Because if God says it's going to happen, happen, it's going to happen, whether we want it to or not. Now, I want to walk you real briefly through the Abrahamic covenant. Now, this is, once again, this is fascinating. This is neat. Now, I'm going to explain the context because some of you are going to look at this passage and go, I am so confused what's happening. Wait till we get done and I'll explain it. Now, in Genesis chapter 15, 8 through 17, before I read this, know that God told Abraham descendants are coming from him as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. So that's what's going to happen. He's going to have all of these numerous amounts of descendants that are coming after him. And he says this in Genesis 15, 8 through 17. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall actually possess it. Abraham saying, how do I know this is going to happen? Now, briefly, who challenged this as well? Zechariah. Remember when Zechariah sits back and he looks at Gabriel and he says, um, how do I know this is going to happen? And Zach uh, the angel Gabriel says, uh, you shouldn't have done that. You should have known based on Abraham based on the covenant that you're going to talk about in the Benedictus, what would happen if God says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. He says, you want a sign? Here's your sign, buddy. You're mute and you're deaf until all these things happen. He knew the covenant of Abraham. So right here, he says to him, God says, bring me a heifer three years old and a female goat three years old and a ram that is three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Now listen to this. So Abraham brings him these animals. He cut them in half, and he laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. So at this point, he says, Abraham, bring me these animals right here, and then cut them in half. Cut them in half and lay them in this whatever setting that was in the day. So that's exactly what he does. And when the, bird, when the birds of prey came to basically feast on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, 
a dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in the land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. And you shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Now, I'm not going to read verse 17 yet, so let me explain what's happening. God puts Abraham in this deep sleep. The sun is going down. It's this dreadful time, the scripture tells us. And what he tells them is this. He says, basically, Abraham... I'm going to raise up descendants. I'm going to raise up a people from you, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then your people are going to go into slavery. They're going to be afflicted. Now, what he's talking about is the Egyptian slavery that lasted for 430 years. So he says, this is what's going to happen to you guys. And then I'm going to raise them up. I'm going to redeem them. And in the fourth generation... They're going to come back to this land, Abraham, the land that you were standing on, and they're going to settle here. They're going to be here. And so that's where we're at in this story right here. And he tells Abraham, he says, you're going to live to be an old age, and then you are going to die. You're going to be buried with your fathers. Now listen to verse 17. This is monumental right here. He says, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these carcasses. Now, some of you are like, what the heck? A smoking fire pot and a flaming torch is passing through these dead animals that are cut in half by Abraham, and he's over here asleep, and God is speaking to him, where Abraham can't even object to anything God is saying. He can't even question him at all. What's happening? Well, this is what is called a theophany. This is a manifestation of God that is in these smoking fire pots and basically this flaming torch. Now, let me ask you guys a question real quick. When you guys make a vow or an oath or a promise, do you always make it, like usually you always make it to something higher than yourself, right? Like we'll say, I promise or I swear on my children's life. I swear on the soul of my spouse. You'll see, you'll hear people say, I swear to God. You'll hear that. Now, however, how many of you ever heard someone say, like, if I was to come up to you and say, I swear on Kyle's life. You don't hear that. You hear people always take an oath and a promise on something higher than them. Now, here's the problem. Is there anything higher than God? Who must he take an oath and a promise by? His own divine nature. So here's what's happening. He's showing Abram right here, Abraham. He passes through these carcasses and he says this. He says, if the things I'm telling you don't happen, <clears throat> let it be to me what happened to these cut up animals. Let that happen to the triune God of scripture. If what I tell you does not come to pass. He can't take an oath on anybody but himself. He is the highest standard. And so he puts his standard right here. He puts this on the line. He tells Abraham, everything I tell you is going to happen, it's going to happen. And he gives him this drastic illustration, this amazing account and story right here for the people of Israel to look back on saying, God means what he says. And so now Zechariah, all these years later is saying, hey, you remember the, the covenant that God made with Abraham? Um, he kept his word. He kept his word and it's happening today. It's finally all being fulfilled today. The 400 to 430 years of silence when it comes to prophecy, when it comes to prophets, when it comes to God speaking, it's over. John is here. The Messiah is here as well. Some amazing things are about to happen. Now, something I think is pretty interesting is I want you to think about this real quick. If the Egyptians were in, I'm sorry, if the Israelites were in Egyptian slavery, 
for 430 years. Most scholars say this dead period from Malachi to the New Testament was 400 to 430 years as well. I think that's very fascinating that it's 430 years with the Israelites in Egypt and then God redeems them. And then from Malachi to the New Testament, it's 430 years and God does what? He is sent and he redeems them. I don't want to look in that too far or try to make anything up out of that. I just think it's pretty fascinating that for some reason God worked in both of those scenarios through 430 years. Maybe I'm way off on that, and um, please correct me if I am later with that. But I just think it's very, very fascinating to look at it in that sense. It seems like God has some type of message within that. Now let's look at verses 76 through 79. We're going to cover this passage in one little, little tiny verse, and then we'll be done for today. I'm going to read this to you quickly. A new child, now speaking of John the Baptist, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Now, in the weeks ahead, I'm going to talk so much about John the Baptist, okay? So I'm not going to exhaust this at all and ruin it for you right now. We're going to get into some deep detail about this man and the ministry and who he speaks to and the time frame, the locations, and all that stuff in the weeks ahead. But John the Baptist, yes, he is in the New Testament. But remember, John the Baptist is an old covenant Old Testament prophet, not a new covenant, not a New Testament prophet. The reason why is, is because the promises of Christ have not been fulfilled up to this point. However, so therefore, I'm sorry, not however, therefore, he has to be an Old Covenant era God. That's when he also passed away was in the Old Covenant. Now, John's main task is to prepare the people for the Messiah. Prepare the people for the Messiah. The text tells us that he is going to give them the knowledge of salvation. He is going to warn them in advance of what is going to happen. But at the same time, he's not only going to talk about forgiveness and salvation and the mercy and love of God. He was a very forgiving man, a very merciful man, a man that also spoke with love in many, many ways. But at the same time, he's also going to somewhat talk about the judgment that was to eventually come. So when John arrives on the scene, he says what? The axe has been laid at the root of the tree. So here is this tree that has grown up, this amazing, mighty tree, right? The tree of Israel. And John says, it's about to get cut down. It's about to be demolished. Was it? Well, Jesus says within this generation, it's going to happen. Did it? It happened in 70 A.D. That's exactly when it happened. So he says, the axe is laid at the root of the tree. Then Jesus comes along and he says, I'm planting a new seed. And this one's like a mustard seed. And it grows into a great tree and the birds come in and nest in its branches. Does it grow, guys, into a tree that just sprouts up 10 feet and stops and withers away over time? Right? Is that the eschatology that we hear in scripture? No, he says it grows into a great tree. He says, that's how the kingdom of God is. It sounds like that tree wins. It sounds like no storm, no devastation, no amount of persecution can take that tree down. There's not a chainsaw big enough to get that sucker down. That's the tree that God establishes right here in the text. So once again, he tells them not only a sign of judgment that is to come, but also but also, he talks about repentance. He talks about love. He talks about the Messiah. Now, Here's a fun thing I want to dwell on just for a minute. If I asked you guys in the church, and we went across all the churches in the United States, and I asked all of you about John the Baptist, all the Christians, what are some things, and you guys feel free to answer, what are some things that people said things about John the Baptist would they say? Anybody? He was a hippie living in the woods. Yeah, yeah. His appearance fell short of the standard of that day. Yeah. 
Who would say that people would look at him and say he was a giant of the faith? Was he bold? Man of God? Was he a perfect man? No. Was he a prophet of God? Yes. Absolutely. I think many people would say he's a great messenger. He's a man. Uh, he's a godly man of the faith. We look up to this man. He's a man um, that does amazing things throughout his earthly ministry. Now let me ask you this question. How many of you would want John the Baptist to come here to church and be a member? How many of you think the churches in Murfreesboro would want John to come and be a member of their church? I say very few. Why? Because here is a man that brings absolute truth when it comes to doctrine, when it comes to every area of theology, when it comes to the way that we live, and when it comes to looking people right in the eye and saying, you need to repent, and if you don't, you are borderline on the borders of hell. Because remember, John didn't have the power and the responsibility to know who was saved. He took everything at its worst, how God called him and told him to, and did exactly what he was called to do, calling them to repentance. Anything that was happening within the church in that day, the body in that day within Israel, he would go around and he would correct. You guys, I had to think about that a lot this week. Would I want John the Baptist as a member, as an elder, as a teacher in this church? And there was a part of me that said yes, and there was a part of me that said no. You guys, the guys, a lot of times we just have a very hard time hearing truth. A very hard time hearing truth. Truth can come so many different ways from being in God's word, from behind the pulpit, from conferences, from amazing biblical teachers smack us right in the face. And us as people that are totally to pray before God will completely turn away from it, will shut it off and will walk and live the life that we want to live. The problem with John, he didn't let anyone get away with that type of garbage. Nobody. When the Pharisees and the Sadducees would come and they would say, who do you think you are, man? Your dreadlocks. You got this weird belt you're holding. You're popping locusts in your mouth and drinking honey. You think you're some cool dude? He would look at them and say, repent. You're on the borders of hell. You white snake, you whitewashed tombs, you snakes, you vipers. You people that are going to end up going through the judgment. The axe is laid at the root of the tree. You're all going down. Could you imagine if that type of message and boldness was preached throughout the pulpits of all America? Now, one, most Christians, most Christians would leave. And they wouldn't come back because they say, John's a big me. And he's a jerk and we don't like him. Right? Right. But at the end of the day, what would happen? The true church would rise up and you would see the gospel proclaimed like no other. What John challenged me with this week was I know people that I have talked to over the last several weeks that look more like John than Kyle does. And it was so convicting. I'm going to tell you a quick little story. Um, we showed that video of, of Jeff and them, and I was honored and blessed to be able to go at the very end of our meeting. They invited us back for, for stuff, and we got to spend hours with them. And I got to go back in his office, just me and Jeff, and talk, just very personal. And when we sat down, I'm used to like Jeff's camera face, like what he looks like. But then when we sat down, everything changed. And he said, like, you're a pastor, right? And I said, like, yes, sir, I, I am. And so I started asking him questions, and we started challenging different things and whatnot. I started asking him different things I should do here in Tennessee and in the Bible Belt and, and many different things. And I said, man, how are all these things working so well for you? But from where we live, it seems like no one gets a grasp on what the truth is. And he said, um, that's where you're wrong. And this time, I mean, he's like, I mean, he is serious with me. Like, he takes the discipleship of pastors more serious than he does any of his other ministries. And he says, it doesn't work here. He goes, we live in the fifth largest city in America, and we can't even fill up our entire church. He goes, it doesn't work here. He goes, if you are going to do this, you cannot be concerned with the amount of people in the church, the numbers. You have to be concerned with the truth. And he says, and when people start not listening to the truth and they start pushing it away, he said, get a microphone and blast it in their ears and continue to proclaim it. 
with love and graciousness and truth, but continue to proclaim it. And he told me, he said, one of the number one things I do when people come up and they say, I want to do a church plan or I want to be an elder or I want to be a pastor, he said, don't do it. Don't do it. Because everything within your reputation is going to get ruined if you stand on the Holy Word of God. And he says that's the exact problem with our nation today. They don't stand on Sola Scriptura. We let tradition, we let family, we let friends, co-workers, and all the garbage in our culture, a secular culture at that, a pagan culture at that, continue to dictate how we live our life as a Christian. So what happens? We end up getting brainwashed. Mm -hmm. For we set aside and we say, well, this is what I ought to be doing. And Jesus says, deny yourself and serve me fully. Knowing that there is an eternity in heaven that is completely with him. That's what he says. So after I heard that and I studied John this week, I had to look and evaluate my life and say, am I being the pastor? Am I being the bold, mission-minded man of God that I am called to be? Or am I focused on other stuff that, that has nothing to do with the significance of eternity? And of course, all you know my answer because I do have fall, I do have a um, shortcomings. Is I had to repent. And it's been a very, very difficult two weeks for me to be able to have to admit all the areas in which I want something to give me gratitude and satisfaction and some type of pleasure in these different ways of church plan. Just being honest and real with you. But when John steps in, he calls people to repentance. He looks people in the eye and he tells them where they're wrong. That's what we want to be at Refine. We want to be able to lovingly go up to each other and say, listen, John set the example of Christ, and we want to set the same example so that you guys will follow that as well. So we'll all follow that as well. Of course, that only happens if we do that in Jesus and we do that together. Lastly, before verse 80, this was a time of darkness for Israel. There was Roman persecution, there was ungodly Jewish leaders, and the corruption of the temple was devastating. And so Zechariah tells us something pretty interesting. I'm going to read it for you one more time. He says, because of the tender mercy of God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the new way of peace. What's so amazing about this passage, he's saying the one that is coming, the Messiah, the horn of salvation that is coming to visit his people, guess what he's going to do? The darkness is covering you guys, covering Israel, because of covering Jerusalem, the temple, the Romans are persecuting. All of this devastating stuff continues to go on. And it went on for hundreds of years. He's saying the light's coming in. And he is going to expose every single bit of it. He's going to bring salvation and he's going to bring judgment and there's going to be a change. That's what he says about Jesus, the Messiah. And he says that there's one that is going to come before him that is going to be the forerunner of this to fulfill the prophecy that was talked about in Malachi. That one day the great Elijah would come. And John comes in the spirit and truth, the power of Elijah to be able to be the forerunner of this amazing Mashiach, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Lastly, in verse 8, it says the child, John, he grew up and became strong in spirit. And he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Now, most believe after a few years after John was born that his parents passed away. We don't know when they passed away. We don't have manuscripts to tell us. Some oral traditions tell us before the age, I believe, um, before the age of around 10, his parents passed away. We don't know how accurate any of that stuff is. But remember, they are at the uh, kind of the oldest point when it came to how long Israelites lived in that day, most scholars believe. So what ends up happening? John moves from all of society, from, Jer from that area of Jerusalem, from the hill country, from Israel, basically. He's still in Israel, but from the actual nation of Israel, ruled by these hypocritical Jewish leaders, he escapes it, and it says that he moves into the wilderness. Now, some of you are sitting there going, how? Like, why? Well, it actually makes sense, because not only does the scripture tell us, but there was a group of people in that day 
that could not stand the society that had came about in Israel. So they all fled and all moved into the wilderness. So this is what John does. This was quite common in those days. They didn't want these people ruling over them. They didn't want people speaking to them. They wanted to manage their families. They wanted to do what was godly. Who do we see the same thing with today? The Amish, right? Try to get away, try to branch off, try to kind of be your own people to make sure we're doing what is godly. Not be transformed by the world, but instead transformed by Christ. So that's what they did. That's exactly what John did. And then finally, it's his time for ministry. It's his time that God has called him to do what he is to do. He makes his way out of the wilderness, dirty, looking ragged, looking the way that he would have looked being there in the desert and the tree lines and all these mountains and the hill country for all these years. And now he is going to proclaim the good news and basically proclaim the message of the Messiah that was about to come on the scene. So what he's doing right now is Zachariah knows what his son is going to do. He knows before his death his son is going to move off into the wilderness. He is going to be the forerunner for the Messiah. And then eventually Jesus comes, takes over John's ministry in a way. John completely denies himself, eventually goes to prison, and is beheaded because of the bold stance that he took by following God's holy word. Okay? So in closing today, this Benedictus is a prophecy and it is a praise to God. It is one that is highlighting that the Messiah is coming as a warrior and one that is coming to bring salvation to his people. Before, they are looking at this picture, looking ahead. Today, we are looking back at the picture saying everything God said would happen did happen. It was fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Of course, now today we are awaiting the return of Christ and no one knows the hour of that day. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for the words that went out this morning. God, we thank you for the amazing and mighty work, God, as we close up in chapter one that you did through Zechariah, that you did through Elizabeth. Um, God, we thank you for the amazing, uh, just the example that they set throughout the course in this chapter. Um, as you have called them blameless, as you have called them righteous, if you, um, as we know that they were, he was a priest God and a, a godly one at that. We thank you for the, the praise report right here and this benedictus that you have given us. God, may we as a congregation, as a church, continue to praise you in the same way. May we continue to lift you up, God, even though we have weeks like this past one that are quite difficult to get through. God, we know that you are the sovereign. God, we know that there is a resurrection that is coming. God, we know that you are the one that is in control. And God, what's so amazing about us and everything that you have established in you and your word is we know it's true, God. You just continue to show us over and over again that what you say is going to happen. We thank you for the covenant that you have made with your people. God, I just ask today that you just um, keep us safe on our travels. And I ask you to just give us a blessed week. Help us to honor you, God, whether we're at work. God, whether uh, we're at home with our family. God, whether we're out with our friends or just chatting with our spouse. May our conversations, may all that we do give glory and honor to you. Thank you so much for this congregation and so much for what they mean to me and Brittany and Wade. We love you and praise you. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.